Unfortunately, I first heard about High Square Girl about four years ago when there was this insane lawsuit where SNK was suing Square Enix for copyright infringement allegations over the use of their IPs in the manga series. And I did a little research on what that series is about, and whether you think SNK was in the right or they were just being petty and greedy, at the end of the day, an anime adaptation about 90s Japanese arcade culture wasn't being made, and that blows chunks. I mean, that premise alone would have gotten me to give that series a chance. But anyways, fast forward to present day, and on Netflix, High Score Girl was eventually released. And I wish I'd surprise you with what I have my thoughts on, but honestly, I already gave it away in the title. This is my personal favorite anime of 2018. But let's go through this review, point out the things I love, point out some of the things I dislike, and hopefully convince you to give this series a chance if you haven't already. High Score Girl is a 12 episode seinen rom-com Netflix anime that adapts from the manga of the same name. Our protagonist, Haro Yaguchi, is not a very smart 6th grader, nor is he all that athletic, but goddamn is he good at video games, and he's even one hell of a guile player in Street Fighter 2. Well, one day gaming on Street Fighter 2 at a local arcade, he encounters a skilled Zangief player that manages to defeat him in every match possible. Turns out, the Zangief player was his classmate, Akira Ono. Polar opposite to Yaguchi, she is a rich, smart, and beloved by his classmates. Frustrated from losing to Ono over and over again in Street Fighter, Yaguchi resorted to using underhanded tactics like Guile Turling to break her streak. This led to him getting his face punched in by Ono, but that was the start of an unlikely rivalry slash friendship over their common love for video games. Chronologically, for this 12 episode series, the timeline does span between 1991 to 1995 up to where the releases of the Sega Saturn and PlayStation 1 were happening. So we go through Yaguchi's life from the 6th grade all the way to his freshman year in high school. And I said before, this is a rom-com, so feelings between Yaguchi and Ono predictably happened to where at the end of episode 3 there was a bit of a bittersweet tearjerker. But then afterwards, it does turn into a love triangle with the introduction of this other character named Koharu Hidaka, Yaguchi's classmate in junior high. And I think I might like her more than Ono, cause she goes through this arc where she doesn't really understand video games at all, like a typical normie, but then she hangs around with our main character more, watches and plays the games, then she tries the games herself, and at the end of the series, she finally converted to gamer status, and she also outclatches Yaguchi and most of the games in order to win his affection. However, if you're a gamer from the 80s or 90s, and you're only just here for the video game talk and whatnot, nothing else, well, I got some good news that delivers in that regard. A lot of video games from the mid-80s to the PlayStation era get covered to where I can't really list them all, but we got Street Fighter 2 in all its iterations, Splatterhouse, Virtual Fighter, Virtual Cop, even Mortal Kombat, and also SNK games like King of Fighters and Samurai Showdown show up, so we know that lawsuit that I mentioned prior didn't really end on complete sour grapes, so that's good. Because if you want to talk about Japanese gaming culture in the 90s, you had to include SNK. It's a fucking given, they were Capcom's rival at the time. But what about the story and the characters themselves? Well, I'm not gonna lie, I did force myself the infamous three episode rule, which is hard for me to follow nowadays. But the story and characters are, they're pretty good. Can't say I didn't relate to Yaguchi in the sense that I too was such a gamer kid that I've neglected my school studies in the past. And also, I felt bad for him too because I keep forgetting how strict social standards were in Japan to where even school guidance counselors would walk around arcades to see if their students are going to undesirable locations. You dare waste your precious time going to arcades? Pish posh! Yeah, another thing I like to commend this anime for was the fact that it wasn't completely stroking itself about how great video games are. There was a sense of realism and how it was like seen uh, as like this brand new rising medium and of course there were some normal people that would just turn its nose on it pretty hard. Uh, really captivated the 90s right there. Now Ono on the other hand, she's a very quiet introverted character who doesn't even talk once throughout the whole series, I'm not kidding. 
during the first episode, she actually frustrated me pretty hard because of that. She comes off as one of those mute protagonists like Link from the Legend of Zelda series, but it's like seeing it from the perspective of one of the NPCs with dialogue. From that point of view, it's really weird. That being said, I don't outright hate her because her love from gaming comes from the fact that she's doing it for escapism. See, being the perfect classmate and all, this all comes from a strict upbringing from mostly her tutor. I don't even think you see her parents in this show at all. But yeah, she shares the common trait of escapism with Yaguchi in that way, so even perfect people have problems. And of course, Moe, Love, and Otaku are probably going to fall in love with her design because of how cute and purple she is. The anime adaptation was mostly handled by JC staff, who I talked about briefly during my review of their adaptation of UQ Holder. I got like one big question though. Why were all the characters CG again? I mean, I got used to the art design and shit, but again, what for? Character designs aren't super detailed, and yet you animate this like any other typical anime TV adaptation. Limits and corner cuts and all. I, I, I thought I thought you would like add more frames to the movement or something, but no, it, it's still treated like it's hand drawn. Is it to lessen the chance of going off model? Is it for time reasons? Maybe it's for those weird camera movements shots. I mean... It's a slice of life anime about people playing video games, so most of the animation is dedicated to finger movements and characters staring at a screen. Hey, okay. I mean, that's the only question I have. I, it doesn't bother me. I've seen worse CG, but I've also seen a whole lot better. When I discuss this with Windsor, he just speculates that it's just part of the modern times now. Anime is experimenting with CG more and more. And I don't know if I like it entirely. But I'm not gonna let that destroy my interest in High Score Girl. Nor should it affect you all that much. And of course, an anime that focuses mostly on gaming culture and stuff. There is some footage of video games playing all over the place. You see it at the arcades. You see it in the opening credits. And it must have been fun recording gameplay footage for this anime. Although I'll admit they close up on the screen too much to where you don't even see the health bars of the fighters they're playing whenever they're playing a fighting game. But honestly, I never thought I'd get hyped watching fictional characters play Street Fighter or even successfully pull off a fatality in Mortal Kombat. It felt just as hype as an actual FGC tournament. I also really liked how the sprites would appear in Yaguchi's imagination as if they're giving him life advice. Uh, Gao does this a lot too. The English dub has a few localization inconsistencies, if you allow me to nitpick for a band. Example, in the first episode, Yaguchi sees Ono complete the arcade mode of Dalsun in Street Fighter 2, defeating the final boss, M. Bison. But in Japan, he's not called M. Bison, he's called Vega. So in the English dub, Yaguchi comments that she was able to beat Vega. And at first I thought, okay, they're probably going to use the Japanese names for authenticity's sake. It is set in Japan, so that makes sense. But later on, they would refer to most games and consoles by their US names like Samurai Showdown and TurboGrafx-16, Super NES instead of Super Famicom. And a few episodes later, one background character even refers to M. Bison by his US name M. Bison. And then at a later episode, Samurai Showdown was called Samurai Spirits at one point. And this isn't a localization inconsistency, this might have been a translation error or a flub up in the dub, but uh, Street Fighter 1 came out in 1987, not Street Fighter 2. You'll find out what I mean when you get to it. But other than that, the voice acting was fine. Actors like Johnny Ann Bosch voicing the main lead hits the marks and stuff. Uh, nothing too big of a deal. Uh, gotta say, voicing Ono was probably one of the easiest gigs ever when most of your lines are just sounds like grunts, frustrated moans, and crying. And I did like the ending credits music. I want to get that on MP3. And of course the music was composed by Yoko Shinomura, who has composed music for some of the Capcom games like uh, The Punisher and Street Fighter 2 of course. Overall, despite some of my criticisms and complaints, I did in fact love High Score Girl a lot. Uh, obviously it's my anime of 2018. Uh, 
and I was hooked. I couldn't stop watching it, I had, uh, even though I needed to take breaks. It does seem like my kind of show, considering I was a gamer longer than I was an anime fan, so going through that arcade nostalgia trip was very enjoyable for me. I heard a couple OVAs were announced to come out in Japan this March, and hopefully they'll be here soon as well, because the show did end on a pretty engaging cliffhanger. Like I said, it's on Netflix, and it's only 12 episodes, and I give it a high recommendation, especially if you're an old school gamer like me. And if you're not, you won't be entirely lost. The anime does educate the history of games and even some of the gameplay tactics and terminology to the uninitiated to make you feel less lost to the whole situation. When it comes to anime and manga that center around geek and otaku culture, the gold star standard for me will be Genshiken. High score girl is no Genshiken, but it is up there. Third, maybe in second place, I need to do some reevaluation, but it's up there. I mean, if you're looking for a show in that genre, I would still prefer it over that piece of shit show gamers. Well, I hope you enjoyed this review, and I hope you go and watch the anime I recommended afterwards. And I also hope you guys have a great 2019. Dark Scream signing out, and Happy New Year. Take care, everybody.